Well, again, we, we kind of ended in chapter 11, 12 last week. And what's happening in these, in these other chapters is just basically as Paul's going out, as these disciples are going out proclaiming uh, Jesus and the good news, there's so many things that take place. But they're dealing with issues, they're proclaiming his name, people are coming to know him, but yet there's still a, a force against them, obviously, that doesn't want them to continue proclaiming who he is. And then what we're going to do is we're going to jump into chapter 16, verse 16. As Paul and Silas are, are preaching the gospel, it says this, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. Here's what's, what's interesting. We read so much in the Bible of these crazy things that happen, right? And what's happening here is Paul and Silas meet this possessed girl. She's possessed. And what it is, is she has the power of fortune telling. That's what the Bible's telling us here. She has the power of fortune telling. Now, this obviously says something about the enemy. That the enemy, too, does have power. But as we've been worshiping, as we've been praying about, wait, what we've been talking about is nothing can defeat our King of kings and Lord of lords. Isn't that amazing? Nothing can. And so though there's power, we see this here, that this, this girl has the ability to fortune tell. We know that God's going to do an amazing work here. So in verse 17, it says, This girl followed, they followed Paul and us and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. Here's the other interesting fact. She's possessed, right? And she knows who Jesus is. She knows who Jesus is. And she's saying, as she's proclaiming this, the reason why is because if people know what they're doing, they're going to be put in jail. They're, they're obviously, they could be killed at some point, right? It's saying, these people, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. So she's bothering them. She's following them. But Paul, greatly annoyed. It's funny that the Bible says that, right? Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, not the girl. Look what he said. The spirit. I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. The power of the Holy Spirit. The power of Jesus. Verse 19. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews exceedingly trouble our city. What these guys are trying to do is rally these guys up. Look, they're causing trouble in our city. And they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans to receive or observe. It's saying, look, they're, they're preaching something that's completely different. Because at the time, what's happening is that group of people, those that were in, in that time frame, they can only serve certain gods that were allowed. You can serve this god, this god, this god, and this god. That's it. Anything outside of that, you're in trouble. That's the day they lived in. It's like America saying one moment that we couldn't have the freedoms that we have. It would be really tough, right? But some of us would continue to spread the gospel. We'd continue to preach Jesus. That's what we would do. And so in the same context, what's happening is they're going, look, they're preaching something different. They're talking about another God, and they're doing something that we are not accustomed to and we are against. So it's easy for them to rally up the people to say, look at what they're doing. They're trying to change our land. But what's interesting about this whole thing is as these guys heard about what was happening, that this girl is now healed, no longer demon-possessed, the master saw that their hope of profit was gone. What it tells you is they didn't care about her. They cared about what she gave them, the money that they received by what she was doing. Can you imagine? I mean, slavery here. Or even in our kind of human trafficking. Like she was trafficked to do this. So now they're mad because their hope of profit was gone. So they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them in the marketplace to the authorities. No care for her as a human being. No care for her as just who she is. All they cared about was the prophet. 
What's interesting is it says the hope of profit. How many of us in our timeline or our time frame, our life, have been in that moment where our hope was found in profits? Our hope was found in money. Our hope was found in business. Our hope was found in work. You can be honest this morning. I've been there. Or put just, I'm gonna leave a blank here. Hope in whatever it is. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? That thing, that was your focus. That's where these guards are at. Our hope in this prophet, what she would do for us, is now gone. It tells something interesting, though, because I know before we knew Jesus, many of us, or even as we know Jesus and we're trying to grow in our relationship with the Lord, we do oftentimes try to put our hope in different things. We ever heard the term, put your eggs in one basket? Don't put your eggs in one basket, right? Especially financially, they say diversify. Is that a word? Yeah? Diversify, right? Here, they're putting all their hope in this woman who's possessed. It's sad to see, but that's the reality. And here's what's true. We can tell that they've probably made a lot of money off of her. They've probably led a lot of money. They made a lot of profit off of what she was doing. But this is how the enemy works. He does not care about you. Oftentimes we see in our own life where maybe hope is, is found in money, where we're like, man, things are great. Things are so good, right? Financially or whatever it is, the things that I have. Put a blank there again, whatever it is. And it could be good. You're like, oh, life's great. But is that thing taking your focus, your hope, off of Jesus and rather putting your hope in blank? Because things can be amazing in your life, but you're slowly starting to decrease your relationship with Jesus. Ever happen? The enemy is so good at distraction. You with me, church? So good at distraction. Yeah? I've got a lot of cords all over me, sorry. Distraction. I mean, it's at our fingertips. It's at our fingertips. And, and here's the reality. I find myself the same thing. You pull it out, you end up just watching one thing, and the next thing you know, it's like an hour goes by. What in the world am I doing? Distraction. Distractions. Hope in blank. And the enemy is so good at this that he'll use and abuse you as much as he can to get whatever it is out of you. That's what these men were doing. And you know, I don't know how she felt. We don't see that. We don't see a background of, 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 you know, her life or where she came from or even after the fact. But I could assume that at moments, maybe she felt like, this is good. Look at this gift I have. Look at this thing that I can do. While someone is using and abusing her. The same thing with the enemy. The enemy starts to creep in says, hey, you got this thing, this gift. Why don't we use it over here instead of what you're using it for today? You hear me, church? It's very easy to do. Very easy to do. Because God has gifted us in many ways. Who would, it's, okay, it's okay to raise your hand for this question. Are you with me? Who has a gift? Every one of you should raise your hand. You all have a gift. If you haven't found it, let us help you find it so we can use it for God's glory. Amen? Amen? We all have a gift. God has given every single one of us a gift. The question is, are we using it for God's glory? Or are we using it for self-gain? Or are we using it for something else? Hope in what? Because if we're using it for something else, I'm telling you then it's hope in whatever it is that thing is. It's not hope in Jesus. So Paul does an amazing thing here. They command the demon to come out of her, and it comes out that very hour. Now, these guys are mad and they're upset. They bring it to the magistrates. They say these guys are, are teaching different customs. 
And then it says in verse 22, Then the multitude rose up together, of course they did, against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, listen to that, when they laid many stripes on them, so they were beaten, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. So you think old school here. They're actually in shackles, right? So it says putting their feet in the stocks. You know, I'm sure we've seen that on TV, the, sh- the, the shackles that are on, and then you have the chains, right? You're not going anywhere. And here's, here's the reality. You're proclaiming the good news. You know God is faithful. You know God is for you. And all of a sudden, you get thrown, not only just thrown into jail, but beforehand, your clothes ripped off. You're then beaten with rods, probably for quite some time, right? This hurts. It doesn't feel good. It's probably damaging to your back. If we remember what happened to Jesus, right? I, saw, I read something very recently, too, just talking about even just the gruesomeness of it. Who's ever seen the passion of the Christ? Right? Very gruesome. They're saying it's even more gruesome than what we see even in that movie. That his ribs would have been showing from the back. And these guys are beaten for the gospel, thrown in the prison and shot. And in my mind, when I'm reading this, I'm going, Lord, at that moment, I feel like I would lose hope. I feel like I would lose hope. Anyone care to raise their hand with me? That's hard. Lord, we're doing what you called us to do. And we're beaten. We're thrown into prison. I thought you said you were faithful. You wanted us to do this to the ends of the earth. Proclaim your name. But obviously, God does the impossible in those moments. And we see here the radical shift that takes place. It says, but at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. We just got beat and thrown into prison, into the inner prison, the worst part. And at midnight, Probably a little time of recovery as they're praying. They start to pray and sing hymns to Jesus. What are they doing? They're worshiping their king in the midst of their trial. See, what the enemy doesn't want us to see is the enemy doesn't want us to see the hope that surrounds us in the midst of that trial. What the enemy doesn't want us to see is the hope that's found in Jesus in the midst of us being beaten down by those around us that are against us and put in shackles. The enemy doesn't want you to see hope in that moment because he thinks he won. I won. They're no longer going to go proclaim the news and people hear about Jesus. We won. But of course in the moment, they're singing hymns and praying and worshiping the Lord. This is something that we should be encouraged by. This is something that we should read and go, Lord, give us a heart like that. But what it states very clearly is that God, even in the midst of our tragedy, can turn it into triumph. That's what he does. The tragedy is them sitting in there. But as it says there, they were singing and praying. And who heard them? You can shout it out. Who heard them? The prisoners. The prisoners. So we're thinking, okay, If this is my life, right, I'm now thrown in jail. Now what am I going to do? How in the world am I going to proclaim the good news in my situation and where I'm at? How in the world am I going to be used by God? He tells me to go to the ends of the earth, but I'm stuck here in shackles. And what he's saying to them is no matter where you are, no matter the current situation, you just worship me and I'll do what I do. You with me, church? You worship me in any situation you find yourself in, and I will do what I will do. You keep doing what I've called you to do. You might see walls around you. You might see shackles on your feet, but continue to pray and worship like I've called you to, and I will do what I will do. And in that moment, too, what we see here is these men, probably in four walls, right? But what do they do? Keep proclaiming the good news by singing and praying, and the prisoners hear them. 
even in a place where many would say, how in the world are you going to proclaim the good news? There's prisoners hearing the gospel. It should speak to us this way. That maybe you come in and go, David, I don't know how in the world I'm supposed to do this on a daily basis. You can be used in your job every single day. You know what's the first thing that you can do? Work hard. Yes, work hard. Because if your boss or those around you see you work hard no matter what, you're not complaining, you're just working hard, what you realize is this, you don't work for him, you work for Jesus. And if we call ourselves believers of Jesus, we should be the hardest workers on this planet. Because we don't work for that guy, the CEO, or those things. Yeah, you do. But you work for the King of Kings, who's greater than that. And he tells us to work hard for our families, to provide. But we as believers, if we say, look, I'm different because of Jesus, then we truly do need to stand out. And that starts with working hard. You alone doing that in your job, I'm telling you, makes waves. Two, loving people right where they're at in your current situation. You know, Manny, Pastor Manny, he works at a, a steel company up in Clearfield. And I talk to him all the time about a guy that's on his team and a guy that works there. One of the guys that works there went to jail for quite some time. I think it was 10 or 20 years that he was in jail. And now he has a second chance. He has a good job. He's working hard. He wants to see his life changed. And what's amazing is this guy always comes to Manny and talks to him. He doesn't believe in Jesus, but he sees something different in Pastor Manny. And Pastor Manny isn't just grabbing the Bible and doing this to him all the time. <laughs> he doesn't do that. He's loving on him. He's praying with him. The other day they were doing a project and there was acid involved. True stuff. It will burn you. It will literally kill you. And the team comes over. And they come into his office and they say, Hey, uh, hey Manny. He's like, yeah. Uh, can, you, can you pray with us? None of these guys are believers. Can you pray with us? He's like, uh, yeah, of course. What, why? Well, you know, this project and there's acid and ice things and, you know, there's something that can happen. Do you mind praying with us that everything would be safe? Think about it. But you don't believe, okay, let's pray. Yeah. That's being used on a daily basis in your job. They know there's something different. They see your faith. You might see four walls around you and shackles on your feet. But that does not mean that you can't continue proclaiming the gospel. That doesn't mean that God stops using you because you have the shackles. It doesn't mean he stops using you because of your situation. It doesn't mean he stops using you because you made a mistake. He wants to use you. And what happens here is as they're praying and they're worshiping Jesus, it says in verse 26, that suddenly, I love this word here. It's like they're worshiping, they're praising, and then it's like, suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Only something God can do, right? We're in this place, there's no way out. We're just gonna praise him in the midst of our battle in the midst of our tragedy, because we know that he can turn it into triumph. We know that he can use this moment for his glory. But this is what's interesting, right? Because if that happens, and let's say a situation like that happens in, in our time frame, all we could do is go all glory and praise to Jesus. That's it. Because we know this is a natural disaster that took place in that moment. We know it's the hand of God. But what we see here is not only is the earthquake happening, but it says the foundations of the prison were shaken and immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's chains were loosed. Something only God can do. Because why? Because he's unstoppable. 
unstoppable. Verse 27, it says, and the keeper of the prison awakening from sleep. So he fell asleep. He wasn't doing his job. Just kidding. He was awakened from his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul called with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for light, ran in, and fell down, trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? You know what we see here? This guy knew that it was only God that can do what just happened. He knew it. It's the first thing he says. What must I do to be saved? Everything that just took place around me, the only thing I can think of, it's your God. It's your God. That's the thing in our own life. When we step out in faith, I'm going to share a story real quick. It's amazing. We've been praying with a couple that comes here. I'll mention names. Big decisions arise. Who's ever been in a point where you're, you're, you know, you're at a fork in the road and you're trying to make a decision, left or right, left or right? It's a big decision, right? And you're like, I stepped out in faith before this, and all of a sudden now there's this situation that's ahead of me. What do I do? When we're faithful to what God has called us to, when we're faithful to what God has called us to, he will make a way. He will make a way. Even the things that seem impossible, so this situation where they took a step of faith and something was happening and, and, and it was like a, a moment of, of, of confusion. Oh my gosh, Lord, do we, do we not do what you told us to originally do? You told us to take the step of faith. We did. And now we're thinking of going this direction. But the prayers were, stay faithful to what God has called you to. Stay faithful to what God has called you to. And the next thing that takes place is, God shows up, the impossible happens, and that confusion, I believe, which is set by the enemy to cause a distraction, because that's what he does. The fork in the road, where do I go, Lord? The Lord's like, right. But you're like, but the left looks so good. Left is like increasing something. Left feels amazing. Right. I told you to keep going right. I'm not sure what to do we know is that we step into God's will and we do what he's called us to no matter what the impossible happens anyone see that in their own life we need to stick to it be faithful be faithful be faithful Paul and Silas could be at a fork in a road when they're sitting in a prison if we're speaking honestly do we continue to do what God has called us to do or do we stop now If we stop, here's what happens. We get out of jail, we could be set free, and we could be on our way. No more distraction, no more people against us. How easy would that be? Okay, we give up. We'll start worshiping your Roman gods. How's that sound? Well, good. You can be let out of jail. That easy, honestly. Instead, we're going to remain faithful. We're going to continue preaching the word of God. We're going to keep singing hymns and prayers, even in the midst of us being in jail. And what does God do? He comes through. The impossible happens. The walls of the jail are shaken by a great earthquake that only God can do. And all of a sudden, all the chains that were on these men and women are now gone. Only something God As this man sees that the prison doors are opened, supposing the prisoners had fled, it says he drew his sword and he's about to kill himself. And what I love here is you see Paul's heart. As you know Paul's story, we've read about it through Acts, right? We've seen all that's happened in his life. He called out with a loud voice to him saying, hey, do yourself no harm for we're here still. There's nothing to be afraid about. We're all still here. And what does he do? He runs in falls down trembling before Paul and Silas, and he says those words, what must I do to be saved? 
Here's what's interesting. It doesn't end here. In verse 31. So they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and all his family were baptized. Now when he brought them into his house, he set food before them and he rejoiced having believed in God with all his household. So many times in our life we can feel defeated. So many times in our life we can feel like, again, those shackles are on us. The walls are around us. We feel like we're in prison. And then God shows up because that's what he does. He's faithful. When he says he calls us to something, the Bible also says that he'll be faithful to the end. He will allow us to finish what he started. And what's amazing about that, we see that in Paul and Silas' life as they're proclaiming the good news. Those shackles meant nothing. The shackles were just a distraction from them continuing to proclaim. But even in the midst of the distraction, what they were doing? Proclaiming the good news, proclaiming Jesus and who he is. I hope we see this and we realize when the enemy brings distraction into your life, when the enemy tries to show up and put shackles on you and says, that, you know, everything that, that is against you, everything that God claims for you, he's saying the opposite. I want you to realize you do not need to believe the enemy. You need to believe Jesus. What does he say? He's faithful. He wants you to continue in the work that he's given you. He wants you to step out in faith and believe the things that he says in his word. What we see here with this man, he's radically changed in this moment. Because he sees the hand of God on Paul and Silas' life. He sees something that truly can only be him. And asks the question of what must I do to be saved? They say, believe upon Jesus and you'll be saved. They spoke the word of the Lord to him, to all that were in his house. And we know what happens from there. The whole entire house ends up being baptized and rejoicing because they all believed in God. It tells us that even in our, our, our life struggles or situation, God can continue to work and do good. And we see that in that moment where they're sitting in it, but God is still able to move. God is still able to continue to do what he's called them to do. So my hope is that if in your life right now you're in a situation where there's confusion, where there's distraction, that you just ask the Lord to give you clarity. You ask the Lord, Lord, what did you call me to originally? Lord, what's your will? If I know what it is, I'm going to keep stepping out into it and not let the distraction or confusion take over my life. We need to do that. Here's the thing. We need to do that daily. Am I right? Because there's so much distraction and confusion. Because there's so much things around us that want to deter us from, from what God has called us to do. But we've got to remain faithful. I don't know about you. For me, when we read these things, I go, Lord, I want to see that now again. Will you do that again? Will you do it again? That we see even people's own life where shackles are broken, where prison doors are open, where prison walls fall down, and people believe upon your name. There's another aspect to that, that many are shackled by the enemy, that many who don't know Jesus are struggling within their four walls, that they, they are imprisoned with sin. But he's the only one that can save them from that. The only one. And guess what? You have the message of hope for them. You have the message of hope. So why are we still here? Let's go. I promise, two minutes. Let's go. Because that's what we're called to do. And if we find ourselves in those moments, we need to realize, Lord, it's all right. I might have the shackles. I might be in prison here. The enemy's trying to cause confusion and distraction. Bring the earthquake, Lord. Bring the earthquake. Allow the shackles to be broken, the prison walls to come down, the prison doors to be opened, because I know your work here isn't done. God wants to use you on a daily basis. Daily basis. Church, are you ready to continue to step out in his will despite everything that's happening in this world today? Yes or no? Do you, do you have hope? 
All right, all right. It's all right. Give a shout of praise if you can. If we have hope, then we need to be able to go out there and give it to those that desperately need it. They desperately need it. That's our heart. And my hope as you leave.